so good afternoon uh, everyone uh, this is basically a session for uh, post graduates uh, as you know neuroophthalmology is uh, a tough uh, one for the pg exam but all the examiners ask the there uh, there uh, a neuroophthalmology case is uh, you have to keep a neuroophthal case so we basically aim for the post graduates but uh, i think at the end of the session the general ophthalmologist also get some useful information and uh, we have selected our topics in such a way that uh, at the end of the session you uh, can have so many tips okay we straight away go to our session first as you know the optic disc is the most important essential integral part we start with the optic disc evaluation instead of dr dhanya dr leema rose thomas she is uh, assistant professor one from uh, government td medical college alappuzha over to dr leema Good evening, everyone. First of all, let me thank uh, KSOS as well as uh, Dr. Maliga, Madam, to give me this opportunity. As you know, uh, so optic disc is a small blind spot on the surface of the retina. It does not contain any photoreceptors, and the millions of fibers that originate from the ganglion cells uh, travel to the brain through the optic nerve. Now, optic nerve head is three parts. One is a cup, which is a central depression. Uh, which is depend uh, the size of the cup is genetically determined and for a given number of nerve fibers larger the disc larger the cup the disc margin is denoted by the scleral ring the neuroretinal rim is a tissue between the cup and the disc margin this tissue consists mainly of nerve fibers and some glial cells and usually pink a systematic approach for the examination of the optic disc and retinal nerve fiber layer is essential the standard method obviously we are all doing the slit lamp biomicroscopy with handheld lenses which is the best method which is it gives magnification as well as stereopsis now we use contact lenses as well as non contact lenses a contact lens is the goldman lens three mirror lens and the non contact lens have the high minus that's the ruby lens as well as the high plus lens obviously the most commonly used is a high plus lens so we have 60d 60 60d 70d and 90d it is easier to use uses the power of the lens in combination with the cornea to give you an image between the condensing lens and the slit lamp and it gives you a wider field of view now lower diopter lens more axial resolution and the better stereopsis and um, 60d is gives you a high magnification it's good for size measurement 70d gives a good balance between the field and the magnification and 90d is the most commonly used it gives wide uh, field and a good resolution now basically the procedure is you dilate the pupil the patient is positioned comfortably viewing an illumination is called is kept axial the slit lamp you keep it as a minimum intensity about 2 mm wide and 5 mm height beam is focused on the patient's pupil you see the uh, condensing lens at the working distance uh, red reflex from the fundus slit lamp is pulled backwards you see the v, is it as a v do you see the dilated pupil you see the uh, slit beam adjusted to the pupil size the red glow is seen the condensing lens is now placed in between this thing and then you pull back the slit lamp you see this and then you adjust your slit uh, you make to make it very precise in this thing and then then you actually reduce the height to match the uh, uh, disc size so as to measure its vertical diameter and then of course you also have to widen it and look for the peripapillary region as well as the RNFL around it Okay, that's what you do. Then, in young patients, uh, you can do an undilated examination also, but you should make sure that you are having the stereopsis by making sure that you are viewing with both the eyes. Now, what are the things that you look for? You look for the disc margin. Uh, you look for the rim. You look for the cup. You look for the vertical uh, disc diameter. You also look for the vertical cup size, and you look for the disc vessels. Okay. now the size is a wide range one you can have a small disc to the large disc all of them normal and the shape is usually vertically oval but all, almost all the sizes that is shown here are normal now look at the disc margin so you look whether it's well defined or it's blurred as in papilledema now disc size you place a slit lamp coaxial with the observation and using a vertical uh, beam and a scale calibrated in meter you measure the this diameter and you should also consider the magnification factors of the lenses 66d is one and the closest to is 78d cup disc ratio 0.1 cdr 0.4 0.7 0.8 that is comparison of the vertical cup disc cup disc diameter to the cup 
uh, di cup diameter and for a larger disc even uh, the uh, larger disc a larger cup is normal but 0.3 to 0.5 is considered normal now neuroretinal rim you look at the ascent rule that is the inferior rim is more than the superior rim and then uh, that is more than the nasal and the temporal and whether the rule is broken then you also look for the outer border of the scleral ring. You look at the cup edge, you look for the bending of the vessels. That gives you an indication where the cup edge is. You also look for the circumlinear vessel. So there is um, uh, findings like bearing of circumlinear vessel, which gives you an indication that the NRR has fallen backwards and the cup is, uh, the vessel is bare. You can also see diffuse rim loss or focal notches. Now, rim color is usually pink and it can be pale or hyperemic pale denoting atrophy and hyperemic in disc edemas. Now, disc elevation, uh, sometimes uh, it is pseudo disc edema and a pseudo neuritic disc or a crowded disc. Or you, you also see sectoral edema in AO and papal edema. You can also measure the uh, using a direct ophthalmoscope where you focus initially on the vessels around the disc and then focus on the disc and the difference in di diopters is noted. And in papal edema, you get more than uh, six diopters. And in optic neuritis, you get uh, diopters of plus two to plus six. Now, in you look at the disc vessels, the findings is one is uh, nasalization of vessels in normal disc. In normal disc, if it is large also, you can see the nasalization of vessels. But, uh, and also bionetting where the blood vessels seem to undercut the rim or scleral ring in a deep end cup. Now, disc in RNFL hemorrhages are very important. It's a strong predictor of the progression of in case of glaucoma. It eventually resolved leaving a rim thinning, a new RNFL defect, and a new visual field defect. So, sometimes it can be very obvious and sometimes it is subtle. Therefore, it's very important that uh, the glaucoma patients on follow-up also requires a disc examination. Then, the other conditions with disc uh, hemorrhages would be AON, hypertensive retinopathy, and vein occlusions. Now, retinal nerve fiber layer, you have striations, you can see the normal pattern on this side. And sometimes it can be diffuse arnafillos where you see the vessels are a little bared. It's well seen in a red free filter. And you can see focal loss as in wedge NFLD uh, in the second picture where there is a focal loss. Now, peripapillary atrophy is very important. You can see the alpha zone. It's a zone, zone of irregular and hypo and hyperpigmentation. It may be seen in normal eyes also. And uh, as in temporal crescent in myopia, beta zone is specific for glaucoma. There is loss of um, choriocapillaries and RPE, leaving only a large choroidal vessels in sclera. So that is usually seen there. So the beta zone uh, is usually seen towards the disc if both are present. And the beta zone, especially seen on the nasal side of the disc, is very uh, indicator. So now take home messages, analyze the disc margin, the measure the vertical disc size and NRR should be looked into, not the CD ratio, is there any vessel signs denoting an increased cup, assess the RNFL, look for opt optic disc or RNFL hemorrhages, look for the presence of peripapillary atrophy and, and, and all these things you compare with the other eye for symmetry or asymmetry, whatever it is the case is. So these are the five R's which you should not forget and thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lima, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, we can have the discussion at the end of the session. Um, uh, as you know, uh, optic disc, again, is a very, very essential part of the neuroophthalmology. Dr. Lima has covered uh, everything uh, in the optic disc evaluation. Now, uh, we go on to the next talk, Pupil for Pupil, by Dr. Dahlia. She is Associate Professor at Government TD Medical College, Alapura. As you know, uh, it is uh, very difficult to understand the pupil and its abnormality. I think uh, Dalia can uh, go through that uh, session, difficult session. Um, okay, over to Dr. Dalia. Thank you, Mali Madam, for the opportunity. So, from our undergraduate dates itself, we are familiar with examination of pupil under all these headings. So, I'll pertain only to the reflexes part due to amount of time. These are the smooth muscles of the pupil include the sphincter pupilla which have the, got the parasympathetic and the dilator pupilla which has got the sympathetic supply. Pupillary reflexes, mainly important are the light reflexes and the near reflexes. The light pupillary reflex, when light is shown into one eye, both pupils constrict. In the same eye, it is direct and the other eye, it is indirect or the consensual reflex. The direct and consensual are identical in time, course and magnitude. And the both pupils, il when illuminated simultaneously, the response summates. The first order neuron starts from the photoreceptors.
the first order neuron starts from the photoreceptors then come to the pretectal uh, nucleus which is in the dorsal portion of the midbrain at the level of superior colliculus Internal neurons go to the Ehlers-Danlos nucleus on both sides. Here there is a crossing, and in the chiasma also there is crossing. And from the Ehlers-Danlos nucleus via the ocular motor nerve comes to the ciliary ganglion. It synapses here, and by ocular motor comes to the sphincter pupil. Near reflex is actually a synkinesis than a true reflex. It is activated with gaze change from distance to the near. It includes both accommodation and the convergence reflex. The presence of visual acuity is not a prerequisite for near pupillary reflex, and the midbrain center for near reflex is more ventral than the pretectal nucleus, and that is the reason we get a light near dissociation. So we'll go to the pupillary reflex abnormalities, which include both afferent and efferent pathway defects. The afferent pathway defects include the total. Uh, afferent pupillary defect or the relative afferent pupillary defect total afferent pupillary defect otherwise called the amorotic pupil it is it is caused by a total optic nerve lesion or a severe retinal lesion and it is characterized by total loss of vision that is no pl vision in the involved eye the direct reflex in the affected eye and the consensual in the opposite eye is absent that is when the affected eye is stimulated there will not be any reaction in both eyes but when the normal eye is stimulated you will have the reflex the reaction in both the eyes in diffuse illumination both pupils are of equal size that is there is no anisocoria and the near reflex will be normal in both eyes in relative afferent pupillary defect commonly called as the marcus can pupil it is a paradoxical response of pupil to light the cause is an incomplete optic nerve lesion or severe retinal disease which is demonstrated by the swinging flashlight test normally the both pupils will equally contract when light is shown to the pupil and the light shown pupil will tightly constrict rapd when there is an rapd the affected pupil will dilate on transfer of light to it from the normal eye you can see when the this is normally and this is dilating when light is transferred to the affected eye and the eye with rapd is called the marcus can pupil it is an earliest indication of optic nerve diseases even when the visual acuity is normal this is grading of rapd grade 1 is a weak initial constriction followed by greater dilatation grade 2 or just an initial pupillary stall when it immediately dilates it is grade 3 and when there is no reaction to light it is grade 4 quantifying rapd is by using neutral density filters of varying uh, strengths the principle is the neutral density filter will grade light intensity degrade the light intensity in the normal eye and this will simulate an afferent defect in that eye and when this apparent defect in the normal eye balances the real afferent defect in the affected eye the marcus can pupil disappears swinging flashlight test is done to demonstrate rapd and neutral density filters of increasing strength are placed over the normal eye and you repeat the swinging flashlight test the end point is the marcus can pupil disappears and there is equal reaction in both eyes and the strength of the neutral density filter over the normal eye at the end point quantifies the amount of rapd wernicke's hemianopy pupil is due to lesions in the optic tract and in the right in a right optic tract lesion the pupil reaction will be absent when there is light stimulation from the left half in both eyes because of the Uh, crossing nasal fibers and the ipsilateral temporal fibers now efferent pathway defects are characterized by direct consensual and near reflex on the affected side being absent and on the normal side all the reflexes will be present the pupil will remain fixed and dilated as you see in the picture and the anisocoria that increases in bright light because the normal pupil will constrict it can be because of Uh, pathologies in the sphincter it can be in the uh, short ciliary nerves ciliary ganglion or ocular motor nerve use of pharmacological agents can also uh, mimic a uh, dilated pupil in a third nerve palsy the pupil will be mid dilated and there will be anisocoria direct consensual and light reflex and the near reflexes will be affected there will be associated ptosis and extraocular motility affection and it can be differentiated from pharmacological mendriasis by the by using 1% pilocarpine a third nerve palsy pupil will constrict but a pharmacological mendriasis will not tonic pupil this is due to damage to the ciliary ganglion and short ciliary nerves due to viral infections trauma diabetes and idiopathy the affected pupil is larger 
the reaction to light is absent, the near reflex will be very slow and tonic and there is an accommodative paresis and this tonic pupil shows cholinergic supersensitivity of the denervated muscle to low dose pilocarpine. In home sadi syndrome, it is usually unilateral with healthy females being more affected. There will be associated absent, diminished or absent lower deep tendon reflexes. Associated autonomic dysfunctions may also be present along with this. No treatment is generally required. When you have a bilateral tonic pupil, always check syphilis serology. Near vision difficulties can be addressed with the use of spectacles and low dose pilocarpine or sunglasses to improve the photophobia. Excessive sweating, thoracic sympathectomy can also be done. Now coming to light near dissociation, that is the accommodation reflex will be present but the light reflexes will be absent. The common ones are the Argyle Robertson pupil, a bilateral total afferent pathway defect can also mimic this. It is common in lesions of dorsal midbrain paranoid syndrome and in a, you can also get this in a third nerve palsy with aberrant regeneration. In adduction you will have a pupillary reconstriction because of aberrant regeneration from medial rectus to the sphincter muscle which is called the pseudo ARP or the Sarnicki sign. It is a bilateral meiotic pupil which is often irregular. The near reflex will be brisk and normal. Light reflexes are absent. The visual acuity will be normal. And in long standing cases iris atrophy and transillumination defects may be present. Now coming to the sympathetic, so that finishes the parasympathetic pathway. Now coming to the sympathetic supply which starts from the first order neurons from the hypothalamus down to the ciliospinal center of the buds from CA to T2. From here it passes post, uh, along the thoracic sympathetic chain, it, uh, along the apex of the lungs it comes to the superior cervical ganglion, synapse here and postganglionic fibers along the internal carotid plexus, cavernous sinus where it then uh, leaves and joins the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, the long ciliary nerves and come to the dilated pupil. Few fibers also go to the mullous muscle on both the lids. You also have pseudomotor fibers coming from the pseudo, uh, superior cervical ganglion to the uh, glands of the face. And accordingly, you can have lesion central uh, preganglionic or postganglionic. In Horner syndrome, which is oculosympathetic paresis, it is usually unilateral. There will be mild ptosis because of the weakness of the mullous muscle. Slight elevation of the lower eyelid because of the upside, it is called the upside down ptosis. Meiosis because of the unopposed action of the sphincter. Anisocoria which is more in the dim light. The pupillary light reflexes will be and near reflexes will be normal. And in congenital cases and long standing cases you can have hypochromic heterochromia of the affected iris. And when there is a, a, a lesion below the superior cervical ganglion reduced ipsilateral sweating of that side of the body also. Now, associated features with the, when there is central horners, preganglionic, it can be a preganglionic, it can be a sign of lung uh, malignancy also. Now, horners, the associated features, you can confirm the diagnosis with apraclonidine or cocaine, and 1% hydroxyamphetamine will help you to differentiate whether it is preganglionic or postganglionic. Now, Hutchison's pupil, which is very important, it is useful in assessing head injury in stage 1. When there is an increased intracranial tension, the ipsilateral pupil constrict initially because of irritation, but the contralateral pupil will be normal. And as I, time passes and the intracranial tension rises, because of the parasympathetic paralysis, the ipsilateral pupil dilate and contralateral pupil starts constricting because of the irritation spreading onto the normal side. And in stage 3, because of parasympathetic paralysis, both the pupils will be dilating. So, always avoid midriatics in head injury as far as possible as the pupil needs repeated assessment. In diabetes, the pupil can be of varying, can be constricted, tonic, sluggish reaction and in pup usually the third nerve palsy is pupil sparing because the, of the ischemia sparing the pupillary fibers. So, the take home messages are assessment of pupil helps a lot in the diagnosis of many ocular and neurological diseases. A careful examination of pupil for even subtle changes plays a key role in diagnosis which even may be life saving or vision saving for your patient with early interventions possible. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Bania for that uh, wonderful presentation. She made the pupil uh, in a nutshell. Uh, so uh, we can understand the, how the importance of examination of the pupil sometimes it may be life saving as in head injury. So avoid the last sentence written by Dr. Dahlia, avoid midriatics if possible in all cases of head injury because that can we can miss 
I have seen some people. Okay. Now we go on to our next speaker. She is uh, Dr. Sinemol, Dancing Eyes, Basics on Abnormal Eye Movements. As you know, nystagmus is a tough subject. She, I think she will make it very simple. Okay, over to Dr. Sinu. She Good afternoon, She is a national professor at Government Medical College, Thrissur. First of all, I thank Dr. Maliki and KSOS for this opportunity. My topic is Instabilitus Ocularum, the Dancing Eyes, nothing but nystagmus. Nystagmus is an involuntary, rapid, rhythmic, repetitive movement of the eye in horizontal, vertical direction or maybe rotatory. It can be pendular or jerky, continuous and continuous or paroxysmal. For the pages, please remember the uh, definition, involuntary, rapid, rhythmic, repetitive movement of the eye. Now, you, to understand nystagmus, you need to understand these terms and we will see one by one. First of all, what do you mean by pursuit and saccade? Okay, this is the basic physiology of tracking eye movement, uh, pers smooth pursuit and rapid saccade. And this is the basis of nystagmus also. Uh, pursuit means it's a slow, smooth movement of the eye to keep the moving object in fovea. It's a voluntary movement. Whereas saccade is a rapid ballistic movement of the eye to abruptly change the point of fixation. Just let me uh, tell you one example. Just imagine Manju Vaidar is walking from there to here. What all your eyes will do? You will be slow. Your eyes will be uh, smoothly following her to keep her in the fovea. Okay? Then suddenly, I should be right there. Just there. <laughs> what what all, all your eyes will do? There will be a rapid ballistic movement of the eye to change point of fixation. So that is pursuit and saccade. Coming to the next term, what do you mean by pendular or jerky? Pendular means it's a sinusoidal oscillation. Sorry, I'll... S so you can... You can see this video. This is the sinusoidal oscillation just like your pendulum with the equal uh, movement in both directions. And there is no corrective saccade. Okay. So we can just say the direction is either horizontal or vertical. Whereas jerky movement means there is slow drift in one direction with corrective saccade. So this is jerky nystagmus. Now the plane of movement of nystagmus. The nystagmus, uh, the eyes can move in different planes, either in the hor horizontal plane that we call as horizontal nystagmus or it can be in the vertical direction that is vertical nystagmus or it can be rotatory or torsional. You see that video, you can see the rotational movement of the eye. So that is a torsional nystagmus. Now coming to the next term, you need all these terms to describe the nystagmus. The PGs, you should describe the nystagmus based on these terms. So now, com now coming to amplitude of nystagmus. What do you mean by amplitude? Amplitude is the excursion of nystagmus. How much the eye moves. See, this is uh, there is a large movement, more than 15 degree. So that is a large nystagmus. And moderate means 5 to 15 degree. And here you can see fine nystagmus. More, uh, just less than 5 degrees. So, this is a fine nystagmus in one direction. And now coming to the frequency of nystagmus. Frequency means the number of two and fro moments per second. So, uh, here also you can see slow nystagmus to right side, or one or two per second, whereas medium means three to four per second, and fast means more than five per second. So, this is a fast nystagmus in uh, looking in that direction. Okay, you remember this patient, we'll come to this later. Now coming to the next term, whether the nystagmus is conjugate or dissociated. Conjugate means it's bilateral and symmetrical. Just simple, it is bilateral and symmetrical in direction, amplitude and frequency. That is conjugate nystagmus, whereas dissociated means it differs between the two eyes. Okay, now coming to what is manifest and latent nystagmus. Manifest nystagmus is present all the time, just like manifest squint. Whereas latent nystagmus is present only when one eye is covered. You can see that video. See that there is nystagmus in, in his uh, left eye. And when the cover is removed, this nystagmus will disappear. Okay, so that is latent nystagmus. And there is another term that manifests latent nystagmus that is present in all times, but intensity increases when one eye is covered. Okay, now coming to what is oscillopsia. Oscillopsia is a 
illusion of that objects are moving you can see this is a very troublesome symptom of nystagmus but not present in all cases okay now coming to what is null zone null zone it is very important this is the position in which nystagmus is minimal and patient will uh, patient adopts head position to keep eyes in this null zone and in surgical management of nystagmus the null zone is centered okay just remember this much and now we will see what are the causes for nystagmus okay so etiologically we can classify nystagmus as physiological nystagmus and pathological nystagmus okay physiological nystagmus, nystagmus means it is a function of the normal oculomotor uh, nerve and the uh, system so it is normal it is normal in normal people okay so it is uh, the important varieties are optokinetic nystagmus endpoint nystagmus and physiological vestibular nystagmus and all these are pathological nystagmus coming to physiological nystagmus the most important varieties are physiological vestibular nystagmus or vestibulo ocular reflex it is the reflecti reflexive movement of the eye that keeps the visual image stable on the retina during brief high frequency rotation of the head uh, you you remember the cows no cold opposite warm same side caloric test we studied in end so this is more concerned with the end people for us optokinetic nystagmus is very important and also endpoint nystagmus coming to optokinetic nystagmus this is the physiologic movement of the eye in response to large moving visual field you can observe this in your co passenger of uh, in a in a railway journey okay so this is the there's a smooth pursuit followed by corrective saccade and we can uh, use this okn drum to test this especially in case of visual acuity testing in preverbal children and test for malingering so this is normal okay okn is normal now coming to pathological nystagmus depending on the age of onset it can be early onset or childhood nystagmus or acute nystagmus or adult onset early onset nystagmus we have infantile idiopathic nystagmus or congenital motor nystagmus then sensory nystagmus latent nystagmus and spasmus nutans latent nystagmus you have already seen now coming to the first variety that is the infantile idiopathic nystagmus or congenital motor nystagmus this is the most common type we see in children it is idiopathic there is no causative abnormality and the characteristics it is horizontal pendular in all directions of gaze there is null zone so the, the patient will adopt head position oscillopsia is absent here convergence and sleep abolishes nystagmus so you can just remember this mnemonic congenital convergence and diclosure dampen nystagmus oscillopsy is absent null zone is present it is uh, horizontal direction nystagmus pendular uh, near visual acuity is good inversion of okn is present here another uh, characteristic inversion of okn and it abolishes in sleep okay now coming to the next variety congenital sensory nystagmus from the term itself you know there is some problem with the sensory pathway there is sensory deprivation nystagmus developing as a result of that uh, seen in bilateral media opacities congenital cataract bilateral retinal diseases like uh, retinal uh, coloboma then bilateral optic nerve abnormalities like uh, optic nerve hypoplasia optic atrophy coloboma and also in albinism so you have seen albinism albin uh, children and they are having congenital sensory nystagmus now coming to the very interesting variety this is the spasmus nutans this is a triad of binocular small amplitude pendular nystagmus associated with the head nodding and abnormal head posture or torticollis okay this uh, this manifest sorry this manifests at first first year of life and results by first decade and usually benign condition but there will be some reduced visual acuity uh, but sorry uh, but uh, regarding nystagmus of childhood always think of another important life threatening dd that is gliomas so before you say yeah, this is normal it's okay you just uh, order for a neuroimaging that will be safe can i have two more minutes now uh, sorry now coming to sorry Sorry, 
okay now coming to pathological adult uh, adult onset acquired nystagmus we have we can just uh, uh, pass through the important ones one is peripheral nystagmus or vestibular nystagmus peripheral vestibular nystagmus central nystagmus and the special types of nystagmus peripheral nystagmus means this is as a result of disease of vestibular organ okay like labyrinthitis meniere's disease drugs and it is associated with a severe vertigo maybe there will be vomiting and hearing loss and this the character of nystagmus is mis mixed here there will be horizontal nystagmus with the, some torsional components and the nystagmus uh, uh, is uh, when the patient is looking away from the side of lesion and visual fixation will dampen this nystagmus and there is fatigability that is on repeated testing this nystagmus will decrease okay that is peripheral nystagmus for end people okay now coming to central nystagmus this is the uh, this is as a result of disease of the cns either brain stem or cerebellum or its connection with the vestibular apparatus so this is associated with just mild vertigo and the associated findings are long tract signs and cranial nerve signs this is central nystagmus and the character is classically purely horizontal or purely vertical or purely torsional okay just differentiate it from peripheral nystagmus then nystagmus is more towards the side of lesion and there is no change of nystagmus with fixation and there is no fatigability hope you understood that now coming to uh, gaze walk nystagmus this is again a jerky nystagmus uh, in lateral gaze or up gaze obese alexander's law alexander's law, law is nystagmus increases in amplitude and frequency as the patient looks in the direction of fast face and these are the causes coming to special types of nystagmus you have seen this patient isn't it this is actually this is a very classical bruns nystagmus okay this is a bilateral nystagmus with a combination of slow large amplitude nystagmus towards the side of lesion and rapid small amplitude nystagmus away from the side of lesion this is large amplitude slow nystagmus to that side and rapid uh, small amplitude nystagmus away from the side of lesion this, this is classical of cp angle tumor and meningioma that is brunt's nystagmus now coming to upbeat and downbeat nystagmus upbeat nystagmus is seen in posterior fossa lesion you can see that the fast component is towards up, up side and uh, cerebellar vermis lesions downbeat is just opposite seen in uh, chiari malformation cervical medullary junction lesion cerebellar flocculus lesions now coming to next interesting variety that is seesaw nystagmus this is again a pendular nystagmus this is one of the question in today's case seesaw nystagmus you will see in supracellular and paracellular uh, mass lesions a craniopharyngioma there is indorsion of the elevating eye and the extorsion of the descending eye okay it's a pendular nystagmus with indorsion of elevating eye and the extorsion of descending eye now coming to convergence retraction nystagmus this is also very interesting this is typically seen in perinode syndrome the dorsal midbrain uh, syndrome and you know the features of it there is there will be vertical gaze palsy light near dissociation and convergence retraction nystagmus you can just ob observe that there is vertical gaze palsy and on up gaze on uh, attempted at gaze there, there is convergence of the globe retraction of the globe and there is nystagmus then coming to abduction nystagmus this also we come across uh, uh, in internuclear internuclear ophthalmoplegia this is a dissociated nystagmus this right eye it is going for nystagmus left eye lack of adduction and now left eye is uh, 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 showing nystagmus and there, there is lack of adduction the other eye this is actually a bino bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia otherwise called webino wall eyed internuclear ophthalmoplegia very classical finding uh, there is the on the side of lesion adduction is limited and the normal side will go for abduction and there will be nystagmus that is the abduction nystagmus and the treatment options we have all these options that is beyond the scope of uh, this discussion and thank you for the patient hearing thank you thank you thank you dr sinu now next we go on to our next speaker uh, dr thomas arun vargis he is a uh, glaucoma and neuroophthalmology consultant his uh, uh, fa uh, favorite subject is uh, now uh, neuroophthalmology he is now consulted at jacobs eye hospital alphonse eye hospital pala and todupura st joseph's hospital kajirapalli he has immense experience in um, glaucoma and neuroophthalmology he, he won best paper synapse uh, neuroophthalmology conference in 20 
16 and he is a speaker uh, and our old quiz master at KSOS. Over to uh, Arun. Thank you very much Dr. Maliga for this opportunity. My talk will be mainly a clinical based uh, talk, Not uh, may not be that much exam oriented but hopefully it will be useful for you even after your exams. So double vision, uh, the where and the why of the, of the double vision, the cause can be in the eye, the orbit, the extraocular muscle, the neuromuscular junction, ocular motor nerves or the brain and the what. It can be ischemic, a tumor, aneurysm, myasthenia, carotico cavernous fistula, thyroid associated ophthalmopathy, autoimmune, trauma, giant cell arthritis. This is not an exhaustive list but these are the common causes that we see. So just like uh, in neuroophthalmology, history is very important. So history for, again helps in the localization. You can have a sudden six nerve palsy. The sudden onset means it is probably a vascular lesion. So the etiology, you have a big clues you get from the history. And again, the localization with your examination. And where necessary, you need to use the appropriate investigation in order not to miss a serious lesion. History. Dr. Sinimol uh, gave, uh, gave the talk on the last case that she showed of uh, intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. So the symptom the patient says gives very important clues. Typically, patients with INO, they will say they have double vision when they are trying to read. So that is because they are not able to adduct. But equally, a patient with a mild sixth nerve palsy, they will say they get double vision when they are looking in the distance. So all these are very important, give you important clues and, you, and these clues will help you in coming then coming to the diagnosis. Of course, most important thing, the first question you ask is whether it is uniocular or binocular because then a whole, your approach is totally different in either of these cases. You also ask for associated symptoms, of course, any history of numbness, weakness, any history of uh, trauma, surgery, diabetes, all the vascular risk, risk factors and also a brief examination, skin, CVS, GI, all this history can give you a clue as to the possible diagnosis. Diurnal vari variation, of course, in the case of myasthenia, but sometimes it can be applicable to other conditions as well. The checklist in the examination, you need to do a brief neurological examination. You can look at the, of course, in, in addition to your three, four, six cranial nerves, look at the lids, the ptosis. Uh, you obviously extra, uh, extract the uh, movements and the pupil very important differentiating between a pupil involving a pupil sparing third nerve palsy and of course nystagmus Dr. Sinemol just covered and then of course corneal and facial sensation I'll show you in, in, a, in, a, in a, with a with the case how important this is and something always people talk about myasthenia to do the uh, eyes test something I found extremely useful is to check in the orbic orbicularis oculi and I'll show you uh, that with a few cases is really because there are very few conditions where you get double vision or ptosis with weakness of orbicularis oculi and this really can help you in directing your attention towards possible myasthenia and a brief neurolog neurological examination you check in the other cranial nerves as well the 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 all the cranial nerves should be checked a brief examination of the patient, some, some things like a scar on the forehead. I'll show you the, what, the, what this uh, meant. And again, scar of herpes zoster ophthalmicus on the forehead. Mild proptosis, you can see with the napsigus sign. Sometimes a facial palsy may not be that obvious. You can see just an absence of a, a, a flattened nasolabial fold. That may be the only indication of an associated facial nerve palsy in a patient with diplopia. So all this can give you clues as to the possible etiology. Site of the lesion, so uniocular diplopia, obviously you're thinking the lesion is in the eye. And uh, sometimes this can again can be subtle, like an astigmatism, corneal disease, or even cataract, sometimes can be misleading. So typically they say, patients say that when you ask them, the images are unequal, and also the images are usually touching each other. But that is if it is two images, of course. So I'll show you this patient here, previous history of cataract surgery, and they sh she suffered an injury to the eye and she came with double vision and the double vision was persistent even on covering the left eye. And this is actually the fundus photo I took of the patient and you can see the two images of the disc and the fundus. And this clearly showed so the subluxated IOL causing double vision to the patient and also in the fundus photo. But this patient, this patient she had seen four ophthalmologists, one neurologist and one psychiatrist and uh, her complaint was polyopia. So see, how many of you go out and see the full moon? 
I, I don't know, we don't do these things these days with all this artificial lighting, it's very difficult to see. But she went out, this was a patient in Pala, and she said she could see 10 moons. So she covered one eye and she could see, still see five moons. So she had seen multiple ophthalmologists and then they said to send to a neurologist and her family and friends said she probably has a psychiatric problem and she saw a psychiatrist and so finally she came and she had cataract surgery and all the polyopia disappeared. So sometimes this can be very uh, um, misjudging. Six nerve palsy, again, typically six nerve palsy, there is maximum deficit at onset or maybe maximum within, within 24 hours. So if it is gradually worsening or gradually happening over a few days, it is not ischemic. So maximum deficit is at, at the onset and of course, typically in a vasculopath. But if anything different from this, you need to think of another cause. So this lady, again, her complaint was double vision and looking at the distance. You can see it's a very subtle six nerve palsy on the left side. But again, I am a clinical person. So anything plus in addition to six nerve palsy, of course, in a vascular path, but anything plus like a papilledema, any of other cranial nerve involvement, any congestion, you need to think of other causes. Any mild proptosis, and I'll show you examples of this. And I said, if it's six you are thinking somebody with presenting like a sixth nerve with orbicularis oculi weakness, think of myasthenia. So this lady, this is the lady I showed you with the scar. So she came with double vision. She, you can see she has a, a head turned or a face turned. And you can see she's got a congestion in the left eye. And she's asked, I asked her to look to the right side. You can see the eye does not move, but you see the prominent vessels. And what about, I asked her, what is the scar? She fell off a scooter, her 14 year old son, was riding the scooter and she was pillion rider and she fell off the scooter and had this injury and the symptom, these symptoms started about six months after the injury. So straight away that scar gave me the clue, you're looking at a cavortico, carotico cavernous fistula and that was the diagnosis. Again, a lady I saw in UK on oral contraceptive pill with an attack of diarrhea. So this led to hypercoagulable state and she came with double vision and fundus showed papilledema. So double vision, a six nerve palsy with papilledema means raised ICT. So neuroimaging, all cases of papilledema, MRI plus MR venography. And the MR venography showed thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. And uh, <coughs> that means, <coughs> yeah, thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. So that this can only be picked up with MR venography. And she had anticoagulant treatment and that, le that led to resolution of her symptoms. Again, this is the patient I was telling you. She came with complaint of a trivial head injury. She banged her head on a shelf, a trivial injury, and she presented with double vision. Actually, when she said she was in in intermittently, she was seeing things double horizontally. And when we actually examined, it looked normal. But because of the horizontal, we were thinking probably sixth nerve. But importantly, we had checked the other cranial nerves and there was some absent sensation of first and second divisions of trigeminal. And that meant she definitely had a lesion and obviously it's a multiple cranial nerve palsy and she had an acoustic neuroma. So subtle injury, a, a trivial injury, you should not get misdirect, misdirected by that. That what happens is in, in a patient with a, a mass and the nerve is getting stretched because of the trivial injury or neuropraxia and that's caused the symptoms. Of course, in a pediatric case, never a sixth nerve. This is actually the, patient, the child's father is a photographer. So he took this photograph a uh, mild uh, palsy there and a few one month later they waited and this is the photograph and the patient had a uh, uh, base of skull lesion which caused the tumor in the tumor which caused the uh, double six nerve palsy so approach to six nerve palsy patient i want to spend time so anything atypical you need to go for imaging that's third nerve palsy i'll just briefly run through so again the plus symptoms Incomplete or pupil involving, go for go go pupil involving, go for imaging. Look for other features, as I said, uh, anything orbicularis weakness. Think of other causes. This is a pupil sparing third nerve palsy, diabetic, and this is a pupil uh, involving. This lady is actually post-op cataract patient. She fell off a scooter after when going after coming for follow-up. Fortunately, that surgery was on the right left eye, and she fell off and banged this side. And again, the third nerve palsy recovered. It's a traumatic recovered. Fourth nerve, again, I won't uh, spend time on that. Is, uh, look, going into orbital lesions, so you can have restricted paretic myopathy. I'll just show you a few examples. 
So this lady, you can see there's some fullness here, no obvious proptosis, but you can see the eye is down and asking her to look up. So this is a tight inferior rectus causing the double vision. And of course, imaging, uh, I won't go into that for lack of time. Last few cases, myasthenia, this is my favorite. So orbicularis oculus, ocular priest check, much easier than doing an ice test. And I'll show you fatigability, of course, you all know. And this is a patient, actually a husband of an optometrist at Pala. And uh, one day the, she, he looked at his wife and said, I'm seeing you double. So this went on for a few days and then the optometrist brought, her, brought him. And then you go back and ask symptoms. He said when he's riding the scooter, after some time his hands feel tired. And then this very interesting history, he said, after walking, then he has to pull his leg up with his hand to put it on the scooter. And then if he's carrying a bag of rice, it tends to fall off. So all these symptoms gives, tell, tells you there is systemic involvement. And of course, in this, pa this, pa in this uh, gentleman also had a CT chest, had a thymoma, and he had surgery, and he's doing very well. Another one was a policeman, and his complaint was, again, double vision on reading. Very unusual in, in uh, myasthenia. Again, please check the orbicularis oculi. It is so so easy to do. And his symptom was he said when he's riding the scooter, he's when he's tired, he's not able to pull the use ha, doesn't get the force to put the the mains the central stand. So he tends to put it on the side stand. And he says for the last two weeks, thortha mudven piriyam betunnilla. So this subtle history you can, you ask and he said magga full aanengi piriyam betunnilla half aanengi korupoyilla. So these, all these things tell you very interesting, tell you the systemic involvement and he had a good, good outcome. Last, last two cases, uh, Dr. Malika. Yes. So some, uh, uh, myasthenia sometimes just not, does not fit into any particular pattern of your cranial palsy. So sometimes if you have a high suspicion, send it to the physician, therapeutic trial. You can see here, we re I really couldn't explain what is going on here. You give the therapeutic trial and you can see how he is doing after that. Last patient is a brain. Of, uh, Dr. Sinimol showed this. This case of uh, INO. His complaint was double vision when reading. So when to suspect a non-ischemic cause, onset if it is gradual or intermittent. Think of a non-ischemic cause. More than one cranial involvement, pain, progressing, new symptoms or signs as you are following up and persisting. And of course, don't think it's just a new... Uh, yes, this patient has a CPEO, but this patient also has glaucoma. So please, all patients, do a comprehensive examination and listen to the complaint, give the group close to, close to the etiology, system review, general inspection, and the great mimic myasthenia and do appropriate investigations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun, for that uh, wonderful presentation. He made uh, all the causes, everything very simple. Uh, as he told, uh, cranial nerve palsy, if it is a gradual onset, then think of other causes other than vascular causes. Then another associated other um, cranial nerve involvement with other symptoms or signs, like uh, uh, as he described the condition like that. Okay, now we move on to our last uh, talk in this session. That is imaging in neuroophthalmology. Dr. Sujitra has an immense collection. She is uh, from uh, she is professor at Amrita Hospital, uh, Kochi, and uh, always it is very difficult for our uh, for we ophthalmologist to understand imaging. So over to Sujitra. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Malika, for uh, including me in this uh, instruction course. So after detailed history and detailed. Uh, ocular evaluation, we localize the lesion, then to confirm we require imaging. So CT and MRI are the common imaging modality we use in neuroophthalmology. So CT scan is based on uh, X-ray attenuation and here the bone that is dense tissue appear brighter and here there is risk of radiation exposure and the iodinated contrast material is used. So people who are aller has allergy, we, we have to avoid iodinated contrast. And in renal failure also, con contrast is not uh, indicated. So a CT scan is uh, very useful when you suspect bony lesion that is like fracture, hyperosteosis, sphenoid wing agenesis, bone erosion, calcification. And in acute hemorrhage and in emergency situation also, CT scan is better. 
and MRA definitely it gives better soft tissue discrimination and better resolution and you can take imaging in multiple planes and here there is no radiation exposure and gadolinium is the contrast used here this have been the contrast we can use in uh, renal disease patient also and there are contraindications for MRI that are metallic foreign body and in patients with uh, pacemaker and aneurysm clip and co cochlear implants it is better to avoid MRI and as I said CT scan is preferred in uh, bony lesions when you look when you want to look for orbital fractures or any um, endocular metallic foreign bodies CT scan is useful so here you can see a trauma of uh, orbital floor with prolapse of orbital tissues and here you can see the uh, fracture of lateral wall of orbit okay. it is better seen in CT scan, scan than the MRI so 3D reconstruction of CT picture is useful for orbital fracture reconstruction so here you can see a foreign body in the orbit and in traumatic optic neuropathy the CT scan with 1 mm slice is indicated if we do a regular CT which is done at 3 to 5 mm slice interval we might miss small fracture of the optic canal so in acute hemorrhage again CT is very useful it is very quick so the acute hemorrhage appears very bright in CT scan so coming to MRI the T1 weighted image and here you get bright signal from fat, melanin and subacute sub hemorrhage and in T2 weighted image vitreous, CSF and edema appears bright and it is very useful for detecting pathology and T1 weighted images gives good anatomical details. Coming to special sequences in MRI, the fat suppression technique is very useful in uh, when you want to look uh, abnormalities in the orbit here you can see the normal MRI without fat suppression so here the fatty tissue in the orbit is appearing bright okay so you can see the optic nerve in the center and in the second image it is uh, fat suppressed and contrast is used so op op ocular muscles are seen bright okay. in <coughs> these pictures are in thyroid orbitopathy so first picture it is with contrast and fat suppression so the extra ocular muscles are seen better but in if we are very sure that it is thyroid orbitopathy contrast is not really required but to rule out other lesions we need contrast in the lower picture we can see the extraocular muscle involvement and the enhancement of normal orbital fat in the picture on the right side it is fat suppressed image where you can see the enlarged extraocular muscles and the fat uh, image is suppressed there in if a new suspect uh, orbital pseudotumor again MRI with contrast is indicated and here it gives uh, heterogeneous enhan enhancement in normal orbital fatty tissue are homogeneous so that we can differentiate whether it is inflammation or uh, normal fat in orbital cellulitis CT scan orbit with uh, PNS is indicated to rule out sinus infections and when you suspect cavernous sinus thrombosis MRI is indicated here again any inflamed tissue gives heterogeneous enhancement and in optic nerve sheath meningioma in CT scan gives the tram track appearance because of the calcification in the meninges and the normal optic nerve passes within that calcification and in MRI is indicated to look for the intracranial ex extension of the lesion and optic nerve glioma gives uniform fusiform en enlargement of optic nerve 
and here you can see the um, large optic nerve glioma extending intracranially and in the my left eye you can see the fat suppressed image where you can see the normal optic nerve. In optic nerve neuritis again the optic nerve she um, shows the enhancement. Here we use that flare sequence when we look for enhancing lesion in the brain. The flare sequence suppresses the bright signal from the CSF. So in the first image the CSF appears bright and in the flare sequence the CSF brightness is suppressed so that the brain the hyper intensities seen in the brain is better visualized which is indicative of demyelinating lesions in the brain. In papilledema again we have to do MRA brain with contrast and the MRV to rule out venous sinus thrombosis. So to diagnose uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension we should have normal MRI and MRV. And here the image is um, MRI with contrast showing a large tumor causing obstructive hydrocephalus. You can see the enlarged ventricles and the surrounding atrophic area. And here again the sagittal sinus thrombosis is seen well in MRV in a patient presented with papilledema. Coming to field effect, so we can localize the lesion here. So here it is inferior altitudinal defect and MRI showing enhancing lesion close to the optic nerve. So if it is bitumbral hemianopia, the lesion is in the chiasmal area. So the craniopharyngioma and pituitary adenoma are the common lesions causing chiasmal compression. And if it is homonymous hemianopia, the lesion is in the optic tract or optic radiation. If the lesion is, if the field effect is uh, quadrant anopia, it has uh, localizing value. So superior, but uh, homonymous superior quadrant anopia, the lesion is in the temporal loop. And homonymous inferior quadrant anopia, the lesion is in the parietal loop. And homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing field occurs in occipital lobe lesion and you can see the infarct in the posterior cerebral artery area. In multiple cranial nerve palsy, if you suspect artery aneurysm, we have to include MRA or uh, CTA that is MR angiogram or CT angiogram. So in first picture is CT angiogram showing the dilated vessels in the cavernous sinus area that is um, carotid artery aneurysm. In the second picture is the MRA where you can see the dilated vessel of the cavernous sinus. So if you suspect vestibular schoenoma that is CP angle tumor, you have to do MRI with contrast and isolated cranial neuropathy when you suspect um, uh, arterial aneurysm, we have to include um, MRA that is MR angiogram or CT angiogram and if you strongly suspect then uh, if, you are, if the MRA and CTA is not picking up the aneurysm we can even do catheter angiogram. In angio uh, <coughs> aneurysm we have to diagnose or intervene before the aneurysm rupture so we have to be very vigilant in these situations. So in the second picture you can the patient presented with sixth cranial nerve palsy you can see that enhancing lesion around the optic nerve on the right side. <clears throat> to diagnose acute infarct we have to do this sequence. So in the first picture it is titubated image here you can see that um, hyperintense lesion and in uh, diffusion weighted image again it is hyper intense and in the apparent diffusion coefficient image it shows hyper intense. So we can diagnose acute infarct using these sequences. Vascular lesions are um, very highly enhancing with contrast such so as picture of capillary hemangioma, this is picture of uh, cavernous hemangioma 
So the Kavanasi manjamas are well circumscribed and it is in the intraconal space and it highly enhances with contrast. And this is a picture of AV malformation with enhancement with contrast. In keratico cavernous fistula, again, you can see the dilated tortuous superior ophthalmic vein. And it is a picture of neurofibroma. This child presented with proptosis, that is pulsatile. So here in CT scan, you can see the absent um, sphenoid being greater wing of sphenoid. And in the MRI, you can see the prolapse of brain tissue into the orbit causing proptosis, that is pulsatile. And MRV, as I said, is useful when papilledema to rule out venous sinus thrombosis and MR angiogram for aneurysm or keratocavernous fistula or arterial stenosis. And catheter angiogram is the gold standard for vascular imaging. And these are all functional scanning. When you suspect uh, metastasis, it is better to do PET CT scan which it will pick up the metastatic lesion. Uh, you will get the hot spot. Okay? It is compared with the other normal, the conventional CT scan. The above you see the normal conventional CT picture where you see the lesion. In PET CT, it is taking up that material. Um, <coughs> and the PET MRI also helpful in localizing the metastatic lesion. So this is a newer method where we can track, um, map the normal visual pathway and we can even um, map the, the, uh, the important areas and it is very useful in the management part that is the surgical management, stereotactic radio surgery. You can avoid uh, injuring the vital structures like optic radiation, speech areas, or visual pathway. So while <clears throat> ordering the image or while writing the request form for imaging, we have to clinically diagnose, localize the lesion, give clinical diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and order the appropriate image. We should not write just MRI brain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suditra. From uh, basics to the last slide, uh, presented very well. Any doubts from the uh, audience uh, to any of the speakers? Otherwise, we'll stop the, uh, this is the uh, last session of the day. Uh, thank you, Suditra, Arun, and Sinu.